You know, when you start thinking about vision, start thinking about what God wants to do within the lives of the church, before you can start thinking about the future, you have to start thinking about reality. You have to start thinking about what we can do. And one of the things that uh, we believe we have to get a grip on is some things about our finances of our church and how we're going to allow the vision that God has laid upon our hearts for the future. We have to deal with where we are right now. And there's a plan that came across our desk just a few weeks ago. And if we impact this plan and get people involved with this very simple idea, it would be able to help us get out of the debt of this facility so we can take the resources that we would be putting on a facility and put it into the lives and the ministries of people in our surrounding area. So it is an awesome opportunity for us to totally get involved with a very simple plan that doesn't cost you anything outside of your pocket, but yet it benefits the ministries of Glenville. And our chairman of our deacon board is going to come up and present that idea to you at this time. That was good, wasn't it? Uh, we have an opportunity to get into a, what Dylan's calls a reward program. And basically what it is, is it's a gift card that we purchase through the church that's got a specific account number attached to it. And then you would load that card with whatever amount, up to $500, you can put on the card. As you put that money on the card, the church gets 5% of everything that's used on the card. If you shop at Dillon's or Quick Trip, or I'm sorry, Quick Shop, or you buy your gas there, you buy your groceries there, you get your uh, prescriptions filled there, all of that would apply. You would still get your Dillon's points as you, use the, as you use the card to pay for it. The, the card has to be loaded prior to you using it to purchase your uh, groceries or medicine or whatever. So you would go in, if you knew about what you were gonna spend, you'd go in, you can load that card, you can do it with cash, you can do it with a credit card, you can write a check for it, but that has to be done as a separate uh, purchase prior to you purchasing your groceries or gas or any of that stuff. It can't be done at the same time. So if you're going in to buy groceries, you can't take that card in and only have $5 on it, buy $300 worth of groceries and add that $300 at the same time. It has to be done prior to the purchase. But then we get 5% of that. So if we had 200 people that spent $100 a week at Dillon's and they used this card, we did that every week, that would generate $4,000 a month that would come back to the church to go toward the building fund. So I think it's a, it's a great opportunity. It really doesn't cost anybody anything. You don't have to be a member of the church. If you've got friends or somebody else that you think would be interested in using those cards, they can use them also. They just have to get the cards from us. We purchased 50 cards, and I think Brenda's gonna be out here to the left right after the services, and you can come out and sign up for one of those cards. But I think it's an opportunity that uh, we can go get rid of some indebtedness and use just our normal purchases and stuff that would allow us to go help and benefit the ministry. So, okay. Thank you. was crucified 
He rose from the grave. He walked around and communicated with people. And then he was ascended into heaven. The body of Christ was gone. Standing and sitting at the right hand side of the Father, making intercession for you and I. Jesus is no longer presently on this earth. When he left, he said, I give to you the charge that you, the body of Christ, the church, you must fulfill the plan. The body of Christ, you are my hands. You are my feet. You are my mouth. You, the body of Christ, must fulfill my calling. He left that to the church. The church. The church became Jesus in action. We must be able to communicate the very things that Jesus communicated. We must be able to fulfill the plan. So you fast forward the church 2,000 years ago. We have a mandate from God to become a body that is functioning to a point that we communicate what Jesus wants us to communicate. But you fast forward the church into our culture, our society today, we soon find out that the church becomes indwelt on ourselves. It isn't communicating Jesus. It isn't communicating the power of God. It isn't giving hope to the lost world. In some areas, the church is so inward focused, all they're doing is wondering whether I like this or you like this or what does the preacher preach on? We haven't communicated the love and the forgiveness and the idea that Jesus wants for their life. What happened? Why has the church deteriorated their calling to an inward focus instead of a God-centered, Christ-followed? Circus center. How do we change that? In Paul's scripture, he is given to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He gives to us a mandate. And this mandate is what I believe the church is all about. We have to change our focus from us, what do I get, to what do I give. Now, when we talk about I am a member... I am a member. I remember the very first time I joined a membership of something. It was a small country club in, in Wamego, and, and they had a swimming pool there, and they had a golf course. And when you joined that membership, we signed on the dotted line, and it cost me a monthly fee, but I got a lot of perks for being a member of a country club. I got to play golf. I got to go swimming. They had a workout room. They had a restaurant. We had all kinds of fun things. It was a small town, but I was a member. And somebody said, are you a member? Yes, I'm a member. Well, you're a member. Yeah, I'm, I get perks because I'm a member. I'm paying my money. I get perks. And I thought I was somebody special because little podunk Wamego, they had a country club, and I was a member of a country club. And I thought I was good. In our society today, they take that mindset of are you a member of a church as saying you get perks. I'm a member. I'm a member of a church. So the church is there to please me. The church is there to do what I ask them to do. The church is there so I have the right and the authority to do whatever I want because I am a member. That's our mindset. That's not what the Bible mindset of a member is. Let me tell you what the Bible mindset of a member is. Paul uses the analogy of the human body. And he says, some are hands, some are feet. Some are eyes, some are ears. Some smell, and some communicate. He said, when we are a member, that means we are doing what God has enabled us to do. If we are not doing, fulfilling the purpose of the body, what good is the body if something doesn't work? What good is the body if the foot doesn't move, or the hand cannot feel, or the eyes cannot see, or the nose cannot smell, or the mouth cannot talk? What happens? We become unhealthy. 
And if a church is unhealthy, it cannot fulfill God's vision for the church. So the question is, is membership of a church sign on the dotted line? I'm a member of the church. Or is membership function? I have a gift. I'm going to serve in the giftedness. I'm going to serve the body. I am going to be who Christ wants me to be. So let me read this scripture to you. And you may know what your giftedness is. And when I look at this in membership, I believe in the, in the membership of the church. I believe that the church needs to continue to grow. But how we communicate this is the church needs to grow from the inside core growing out into our community. We don't want to just say, get into the church, come to the church, come to the church. What we have to do is we have to say, we as the church, we need to grow our core in order for the church to be strong enough and healthy enough that we minister to the community. How we minister to the community is to be stronger as a church. How we become stronger as a church is if we get more people involved in doing their giftedness. Not just get involved, not just doing more stuff, but find out what your gift is, to find out what your core is, and to follow after it and minister in that area. Verse 12 of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, it says this, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, or whether slaves or free. We all have been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, or is there therefore not of the body? And is the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body. Is there therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body as he pleased. Let's do that one again. But God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if there were one, all one member, where would be the body? But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again to the head, to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which think to be less honorable, those are bestowed greater honor. And our unpresentable parts give greater modesty. But our presentable parts have to take heed. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to those part that lacks it that there should be a schism in the body, and the members should have the same care one for another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. One member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are of the body of Christ, and members individually. That is the biggest paradox that you could ever take a look at. The biggest issue that the church has is how can we take six, seven, eight hundred people that are all uniquely gifted by different means, different talents, different skill sets, different desires, different attitudes, different backgrounds, different cultures, different economic system, different educational system. How can we take all of our uniqueness and diversity, and we all have it, into a oneness or a unified body of Christ? How do we do that? How can we make everybody happy? How can we make everybody feel that there's a purpose for them in this church? You know, if everybody loved music, we would get up here and we'd sing 50 minutes of music and two minutes of preaching, and then we'd go home, and you know what? There would be a section that would say, Amen! <laughs> but if we didn't like music, but you loved the preaching... You say, why don't we just have one verse of a song and 50 minutes worth of preaching? And some of you would say, Amen. oh no, okay. <laughs> but you know what? We're not going to have that. We're not going to, why don't we have dramas all the time? What's the deal with the backstage? What's the deal? Everybody's not going to be happy about the effect. How do we stay unified in a body that have all kinds of different diversity? The key is, when you are of the body, we have the person of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. That's the Holy Spirit. And when you're part of the body, 
You've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. You've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. You've been indwelt with the power of the Holy Spirit within your life. We have unity through the Holy Spirit, and we have vision through the function of Jesus Christ. How do we stay unified? If we stay focused on what does God, through his son Jesus Christ, demand our church to be, demand our church to do. We have to stay focused and on task. We have to stay on task. So we have something in common. Our first point, we have something in common. That common denominator is we have the body of Christ for a purpose. The purpose of the body of Christ is to do something greater and bigger than we could ever possibly imagine. We want to do great things. We want to reach the world for Jesus Christ. We want our teenagers to have a passion for God. We want our children's program to grow up so when they grow up out of the junior high and the high school, they have a passion for the Lord. They know the stories of God. They can communicate and they can articulate. When they get married, they're finding somebody that has a passion for God and they bring their family up under the umbrella and the protection of God. That's our goal. That's the church. We're not here to babysit. We're not here to make everybody happy about every little thing. It's impossible. The diversity is immense. But the unity, bring it down to a singular focus, and the unity is we have the power of the Holy Spirit, and the goal is to be the body that represents Jesus Christ in every area of our life. The problem is this. We bring people in the church that have a common goal, but their function is, I don't agree with the vision. I would like our church to do this, or I'd like our church to do that. I don't like the way that the preacher preaches. I don't like the music that they sing. I don't like this. I don't like this. So what happens is, we have a common goal, and that goal is to present Christ, but our approach to that goal causes schisms. So what we have to do is we have to articulate what, again, does Jesus want? If everybody wanted the same thing, if everybody wanted to be the ears, if everybody wanted to be the voice, if everybody wanted to be the feet, would the body be healthy? No. What everybody has to do is, what is my calling? What is my giftedness? What is it that God has called me to do? We have things in common, but we cannot all be the same purpose. We can't all have the same function within the body of Christ. So, but we are all different. The diversity of the body is unique. The diversity of the body. We can look at our families. Each one of us have family. Now, we use this joke a lot. If you have dysfunction in your family, raise your hand. Okay, everybody's hands up. My feet are up. My hands are up. All, I mean, dysfunction. My family puts fun in dysfunction. I mean, it is so bad. But you know what the greatest thing about fun and dysfunction is, you know what? I still love them. You know, they can make me mad. They can do stupid things. I may not agree with what they do, but you know what? If the phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning and something happens to my brothers or my sisters, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to the rescue. I'm going to love them in spite of what they do because of my family. So, in the unity, what we have to do is we don't have to agree with function of everything, of what everybody does. We don't have to necessarily even agree with lifestyle. What we have to do is we have to make sure that they are a child of God, teach them the very principles of God, and in their diversity, love them because in their diversity can bring forth unique ministry. Because if we only had ministry for the good, if we only had ministry for the normal Christian folk, if we only had ministry for the healthy, but we leave out the unhealthy, what did Jesus do? Jesus said, I didn't, hear, I didn't come here for the healthy because the healthy doesn't need a doctor. I came for the unhealthy because they are the ones in need of a physician. So when we become so inward focused, that we don't think about the outside, we don't think about the people that are hurting spiritually, we become inward focused as our church direction, 
we become a membership club. We become something that we do not allow the diversity of our church to work within the life. We have diversity. We need to use our unity. And the unity is the Holy Spirit indwelt within us, focused directly upon what God, through his son Jesus Christ, gave the church to do, is to be the body of Christ. So, we all need to be heading into a common direction. We all need to be headed in a common direction. So, when we're looking at the body, we're looking at the church. If we use that metaphor of the hands and the feet, if my feet want me to go this direction, but my head tells me to go this direction, and my eyes want me to go this direction, I am going to be totally confused. I'll be falling flat on my face. And if 80% of all of our churches, all of our churches, if 80% or higher of our churches are stagnated or declining, we have lost vision of the body of Christ. How do we lose vision? Because we are not singular in focus. We think about what we want and not what Christ wants. So in order to have a healthy church, we have to understand, what does Christ want for us? So, and it's very easy to see this. The first thing that we have to do is, first say, what does the Bible say? Not what I say, not what you think, but what does the Bible say? In order to have common direction, we have to understand what the Word of God says. And if the Word of God communicates it to us, we as the church cannot go against the Word of God. It is the absolute mandate that God has given to us. It is the word of God. Jesus has said, I have given to you the power and the authority to communicate the very word of God. So we are Christ in action. We do not have the right to go against God's word. We must stand up for God's word. So our direction has to be, what does the Bible say about life? So when we say, I don't care what the Bible says, or I don't like what the Bible says, or I don't agree with what the Bible says, we are going to have a schism in the body. Would you agree? If 50% say, well, I don't care about the Bible, at 40% says, well, I like the Bible, but we have 10 people that said, I don't even believe about the Bible, but yet they're all members of the body, which way is the church going to go? They're going to be torn to and from. Why is that? Because they do not have a direction of what God wants for them. So in order to be a member of a church that's healthy, we first have to say, what is the purpose of the church? The purpose of the church is directional. It is moving forward, never stagnated, to win and to reach people to Christ. After the church has moved to a point that it reaches people for Christ, it is then the purpose of the church is to disciple them so the church continues to grow numerically in the core so they can reproduce themselves to reach more people for Christ. If we ever get to the point that is not thinking outside the doors, we're not reproducing ourselves to others, it starts becoming an inward direction instead of an outward direction, what happens is the church stagnates. The church dies. I was talking to my dear mother this week, and uh, she said, Bruce, my church just had a split. And I said, well, why'd they have a split? She said, well, all the young people left, all the old people stayed. And I said, you, you stayed, right? <laughs> so, but they didn't, like, they didn't like the music, so they quit the church. The preacher preaches too long, so they quit the church. So I said, Mom, how big is your church? Well, it was 200. I said, how big is it now? Now it's about 80. Well, how old is the youngest person in church? About 85. <laughs> I said, well, all the young people, the 70-year-olds and down, all left the church. It's a small town of 3,000 people. And I'm thinking, how can a church, if they are singular in focus, split 
because of stupidity about music or about the length of a sermon. Because the focus is on who? Jesus. The focus is, are we reproducing ourselves in Christ? Is it about the body that's in here or is it out, out there that need the cause of Jesus Christ? We are Jesus in action. What would we be if Jesus would come in here now and say, I am going to come back and I am going to be exactly what you are? Would the church be different? Would we do something different if we thought we would actually be called to the account of what Christ really wants us to do? I posted this on my Twitter account this week. It says, and so we are here to face the paradox of being so dramatically different, we see the marvelous problem which confronts Glenville, and that is how to preserve the diversity while maintaining our unity. How do we preserve? How do we keep your personality, your giftedness, your ideas, your creativity, your desires, your passions? How do we keep all of the things that make you unique in all the diversity of every person within the church? We need that. We, are, we, we need a church that has passion in every different area, but funneled to a unified purpose. If we could take our diversities, funnel it into a purpose of unity to reach people for Jesus Christ and to change their life and to motivate us to become a follower after Christ so then we can produce ourselves and others, then we became singular in focus. But if we continue to go in 50 different directions, not knowing what we're doing or how we're doing or why we're even doing it, let's just start a member... Let's start a ministry because somebody wants one. Let's start this because somebody needs one. No, we have to understand what are we called to do? Singular in focus. Now, in doing so, when the church grows, because the health of the body of the church grows, remember it says, Jesus brings to the body who he pleases. Okay? What's that mean? That means if we are doing our job as a church, if we are reaching people for Christ, if we are serving out of our gift mix, Jesus looks at us and says, I trust you. You're doing a good job. You're being what I need you to be. I'm going to bring people in for you. Because I know that your hand is weak. I'm going to bring somebody in that can strengthen up your hand. Or somebody may say, your hearing is off. I'm going to bring somebody in that can hear. And some of you guys will agree with this. The speaking is weak. I'm going to bring somebody in that can help the speaking. You know, when somebody comes into the body of Christ, they're here not because of any other reason. They are here because God put them into the body of Christ. They are here because God wanted them to be here. It is not my job, nor is it your job, to say, we don't want you. I'm not God. My job is to make sure they have a place to serve. My job is to make sure they are equipped to serve. They learn enough to serve. So when we use our diversity into a singular purpose, people come into the church because it pleases God to bring them into the church. Our church grows because they are invested and they have purpose and they desire the church to grow. So, but when part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. Here's the, here's the issues within the church. It's, it's fun when everything's great. When kids are going to camp, we have all these kids, they're going to put a bracelet down on their, on their hand, you're going to be praying for those kids, and we're going to have all the kids going to camp, and next week the kids are going to come back, and they're going to give testimony how God worked within their life. And everything's wonderful, and it's awesome to see kids' lives change. Two weeks from now, Tim's going to take a camp down at Camp Hiawatha. There'll be 100 kids going to camp down there. They're going to come back, and they're going to talk about all the wonderful things that take place. And we can stand up, and we say, hurrah, because God is doing great and mighty things in the body of Christ. Kids are getting saved. Lives are rearranged. It's awesome to see that. But when somebody's in the hospital, they're about ready to die. 
or their kids are giving them chaos, or there's a divorce that's taking place, or there's financial ruin. What happens is automatically people put a mask on their face. Uh, I don't want anybody to know that my life's falling apart. I, 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 I don't want anybody to think that I have a weakness. And the church says when one person hurts, the body should hurt. When one person rejoices, the body should rejoice. But how do we do that? I believe it's called authenticity. Until the church it has a purpose to reach into people's lives that are hurting, reach into people's lives that are rejoicing, not condemning, and not being arrogant, but being transparent and say, we have a bigger picture. I have understood what you're going through. I have been where you've been. I can come alongside you and pray with you and encourage you along the way. And if we, as a church, we can rejoice when great things happen, but yet we can cry when things fall apart doesn't change the function. It doesn't change what we do. It doesn't change the purpose. What allows us to have empathy through chaos. And when we have empathy through chaos, and when somebody is falling apart and the world is in chaos, and they need spiritual guidance, not from me, but from the body, what happens is the body heals itself because it works together that is a healthy body when people hurt we hurt when people rejoice we rejoice but in everything that we do we bring glory and honor to him in the midst of chaos let me tell you what Christ did for me in the midst of rejoicing let me tell you what Christ did for me let me tell you how he healed me. Let me tell you how he helped me. It's not like what I can do or what you can do. It's not about the name of Glenville. It's about who the name of Glenville represents. And that name is who? Never forget. It's all about Jesus. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we're looking at our body the body of Christ. Members in particular that you have brought into this church. You know what their gifts are, what their giftedness is, what their desires are, what their passions would be. Lord, I pray that we, as the core of this church, will open up our hearts our lives, an opportunity to allow your people who you pleased to be placed into the ministry, a heart of membership, being part of the body of Christ, being part of Glenville so we can be healthy, so we can do what you called us to do. So Lord, as we pray over this, as we evaluate during prayer time, I pray that you'll give to us a burning desire to do what you called us to do. Using our diversity focused on our unity. Allow us to be different. Allow us to be different than any other church. But in doing that, we are so tightly unified for the cause that we can be different because you're the one bringing us together. We love you for that. We ask you to do that. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to that. We're going to have a time of offering. And then...